Brothers and sisters, peace be with you. I'm Hua Qi. Thank the Lord, it's time to read the Bible again. We'll continue reading the book of John, chapter 1. Today we'll start with verse 15. Through verses 1 to 14, we saw the Word and the two creations, the old and the new one. The old creation was the Word in the beginning, and the Word was with God. Through words, all things were made. The old or the first creation manifested the word's wisdom and omnipotence. In the second or new creation, the word entered time and became flesh. He brought about the fullness of grace and truth. Life grew in believers and became a new creation. We could also say that the old creation paved the way for the new one, and a new creation was based on the old one. The Word be became flesh, and Jesus came to the world and dwelt among us and became our Savior, letting us become God's children through faith and the grace of salvation. The new creation was the purpose of God's creation. In the first 14 verses, John aimed to point out that Jesus was the Word in the beginning, and He was with God. He became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Verses 15 to 17 recorded two witnesses. In the Jewish culture, two persons were required to serve as witness. The number two is a number for witness. Verse 15 is about John the Baptist as a witness. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. John was the last prophet in the Old Testament, as well as the pioneer in the New Testament. His testimony ended the old system and started a new one. He testified, he, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Jesus Christ was before John the Baptist, first of all in terms of time, as he was the word in the beginning. Although he appeared physically in the world after John the Baptist, in reality, he was before John because he was the Word in the beginning, because he existed in eternity. Secondly, in terms of uh, positions or superiority, John was the pioneer of Christ, serving as a witness for Christ. Therefore, Christ was naturally superior in terms of status to John. In this testimony, Jesus exceed, exceeded John in terms of both time and superiority. His witness was an objective one. The second witness is Apostle John, the author of this book. His witness is seen in verse 16. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. The witness of Apostle John was a subjective one. He said, From the fullness of His grace we have all received. In the original Greek text, the words meaning grace did not exist. The NJV version was closer to the Greek text. Of His fullness have all we received, meaning we have all received from His fullness. In the NIV version, the fullness of His grace was added, perhaps for fear people would not fully understand it. Actually, the original Greek text was more accurate. It says, of His fullness have, we, have all we received. So what is the fullness of grace from Jesus Christ then? Fullness means the rich essence of a person. When this richness saturates to a certain degree, it overflows from this person, 
and this is fullness. Verse 14 tells us that Jesus Christ came and made a dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. So when John said, "From the fullness of His grace we have all received," this fullness includes grace and truth. Grace and truth have overflown from Jesus Christ. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ, Apostle John was by Jesus' side while Jesus was performing his ministries on earth, and he experienced firsthand the fullness of Christ. He described his experience of this fullness as "en shang jia en." Grace upon grace, 恩上加恩 can be understood as a modifier indicating that we have received a lot in His grace. Grace upon grace is 恩上加恩 This understanding is all right, but not entirely accurate. What it actually means is that one after another, one grace is received and another follows. NIV version translated as blessing. It is in fact not accurate. Blessing is referring to good wishes from outside, whereas grace is referring to Jesus Christ Himself becoming our blessing. Why do we say it is more accurate to say one grace added to another? This is further explained in verse seventeen. For the law was given through Moses; grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The old system ended with John the Baptist, and the law defined the Old Testament. The law was was spread through Moses. In Exodus, Moses met Jesus on the mountain during the forty days and nights. There, the law was formulated. And Moses received instructions from Jesus for setting up the tabernacle. So the law was spread through Moses, and the law came from the law formulator. He bore witness of God, and the rules regulating people's behavior came from God. This was the first grace from God, grace in the Old Testament. The law was exercised upon the Israelites, and separated the Israelites from the na- the rest of the nation, so that Jesus Christ was created among the Jews. The law was the grace God granted to people in the Old Testament, and it was temporary and transitional, meeting the needs at that time. Paul explained the function of the law in Romans. Chapter three, verse twenty. Through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law was formulated per God's intentions to regulate people's behaviors, but no one can actually follow it in reality. So the true function of the law is for people to realize that they cannot do it themselves, and that they are sinful. So that people can become humble and wait for God's grace. This is the first grace. From grace upon grace, 恩上加恩 The law in the Old Testament was spread through Moses. Another grace, a more important one, is the coming of Jesus Christ, who brought to us grace and truth in His fullness. The grace and truth replaced the law in the Old Testament. The law, which was formulated per God's intentions, was for people to see their own sins. Therefore, waiting for God's grace, Jesus Christ brought grace for us to receive and enjoy. This grace brought provisions. Provision led to the growth of life, so that we can live a life conforming to the truth. Therefore, grace and truth are the characteristics of the New Testament. It was no longer a requirement, but rather a provision. It allows people the growth of life through provision, living a life of truth. <coughs> Here, John let us see that grace and truth replace the law. 
This was God's intention to begin with, as the law was transitional anyway. Before Jesus came, God first gave the law to the Israelites, allowing them to survive under the restrictions of the law. It is the same situation today. Before a person is saved, before Jesus comes to his or her life, he or her must obey the law. Like our children, when they are young and do not yet know Jesus Christ, we must allow them to grow under the restriction of the law, till one day, with the coming of Jesus, they are saved. Then they can receive and enjoy grace, and their lives are allowed to grow. Often we tend to compare law with grace only. Actually, this is not the correct thing to do. The law must be compared with grace and truth, because grace brings about provision. Provision brings about the growth of life, and the growth of life will lead to a life conforming to truth. Some people who do not understand grace keep asking God for blessings. They have experienced many blessings from God, yet there is no growth of life. Therefore, they become a lump of fatty tissue with no spiritual substance, not recognizing the life conforming to truth. And this is someone who does not know grace, as Jesus Christ brought about grace and also truth. Grace is given to us for free, and we're not asked to do anything. Grace is for us to enjoy for free. If you have God inside of your life, with provision from grace, your life should grow. The growth of life will bring light. In light, you will know more about Jesus Christ. Gradually, Jesus' characters will be built up in you. And as a result, your life will be conforming to truth more and more. This is how every Christian's growth of life looks like. Many Christians want only blessings, not grace. Therefore, they do not have a healthy spiritual growth. We must strive to be a well-balanced Christian before God. On the one hand, receiving the provision of God's grace, and on the other hand, leading a life conforming to truth. Only this way can we serve as a witness that Jesus came to us with the fullness of grace and truth. Verse eighteen. No one has ever seen God, but God, the on, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This verse is a summary John gave in this session. Section: No one has actually seen God. This corresponds with chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The concept of eternity in the past was the Word with God. Although the Word was the expression or manifestation of God. No one had actually seen God. Although we can see indirectly God's creations in all things made by Him through the Word, no one actually saw God with their own eyes. Even Moses never saw God during the forty days and nights on the mountain, with God by his side. In Exodus chapter thirty-three, verse eighteen, Moses said to the Lord. Now show me your glory," the Lord answered in verse twenty. "You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. But God loved Moses and showed mercy on him. In verse twenty-one, it said, "Then the Lord said, 'There is a place near me, where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passed by, I will put you in a cleft in a rock.'" And cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So God prepared the cleft in the rock for Moses, hid him in it, 
When God's glory was passing by, God covered Moses with his hand so that Moses could not see God's face. After God had passed, Moses was allowed to see God's back. What does this mean, seeing God's back? This means I saw God, yet I was unable to fully understand God. What I saw was only God's back. Nobody could claim they fully understand God. I could only see God's back. You could see only God's back also. We must admit that our knowledge of God is not full or complete. The second half of the sentence in verse 18, But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This corresponds with, with, with verse 14, which said, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ came to the world. He was the one and the only Son of God. Now he took the image of man and dwelt among men. Only he could become the full expression, manifestation, and the definition of God the Father. Even so, what people saw in Jesus was no other but that carpenter from Galilee, merely superficial knowledge. It was during Jesus' final phase of ministries, when he took his three disciples to the mountain of transformation, that his three disciples got to see the glorious sight of Jesus as the Son of God. In the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, after Jesus was transfigured, a voice was heard from the cloud, and this was God's proclamation. This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Jesus had to come over and encourage them to get up. When they got up and looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Only Jesus Christ could make God shown. To know Father, we must do so through Jesus Christ. The book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, is a very good introduction of the whole book. We have to appreciate the simple words Apostle John used and appreciate the fact that he called Jesus Christ the Word. He clearly and accurately explained the relationships between Jesus and his Father, Jesus and his saints. He is the Word, truth, and life. No one can know God unless through Jesus. It is through Jesus Christ that we have received grace. And grace is for the growth of life. Growth of life is for leading a life conforming to truth. May God help us. Let us pray. Lord, guide us in our study of the book of John in the following 20 plus weeks. Through the introduction, we realized how blessed we are. Jesus Christ came to dwell among us, bringing to us the fullness of grace and truth. Grant me a humble heart and obedient spirit. Let me receive more grace through my daily Bible studies, so that I will let you I will get to know Jesus Christ more and accept his authority more willingly, letting him guide me in my life. Bless my life and my church. In Jesus' name we pray.